The year was 1863, right in the middle of the American Civil War, and a woman named Elizabeth Packard decided that she was going to spend the next 15, 20 years going on a long crusade. So if you know anything about Elizabeth Packard, if you've heard that name before, which I don't imagine too many people have, unless you're familiar with really obscure histories, I didn't know her, kind of put that reference. She's known as a, one of the very beginnings of the feminist movement, one of the originators of the feminist movement, all the women's rights situations that developed around the turn of the century. She was kind of, for lack of a better phrase, she was the mother of those types of things. And Elizabeth Packard was married to a man named Theophilus Packard, which Theophilus was one of the names I proposed for Logan. Melina didn't like it for whatever reason. But she was married to a man named Theophilus Packard who was convinced that Elizabeth was insane. And he committed Elizabeth to an insane asylum for a number of years, and, and there's some argument about whether or not that was merited. One thing for sure is their marriage was kind of on the rocks. But while Theophilus was kind of off doing his own thing, Elizabeth Packer decided that she was going to spend the next 15, 20 years going on a long women's rights crusade. And she used very vitriolic language, very aggressive type of, uh, type of messaging. And one of the things that she described herself as a wife, at least in that day and age, well, she described herself as a wife, as a slave of the marriage union. Now, if you know the time period, that's why the date is important, 1863. Because when you use that word slave, it denotes something very differently to somebody in 1863. They would have been very understanding, very knowledgeable about what that word means. And so Elizabeth Packard, using that to describe herself, describes her opinion of what the marriage covenant is. Elizabeth Packard is not unique. If you go anywhere within the last thousand years, at least when women have been granted a type of voice, then you have this kind of language where the idea of marriage is, is seen by one or the other partner as being kind of insignificant. It's either seen as being indentured servitude, it's being seen as kind of unnecessary, and that's certainly the way that modern day people have begun to look at it. People have begun to look at marriage and think to themselves, well, is it really even necessary? Is it something that we have to have in this world? Or can we just cohabit together? Can we just have that as loose agreements and we just kind of live together? As a matter of fact, several years ago in a study that was done to millennials, they asked them, if you could redefine marriage, if you could set your own standard for what marriage is, how would you describe it? And surprisingly, 31% of millennials argued for the fact that marriage I'm sorry, that divorce, that's the wrong word up there. Divorce should be illegal. That's a really awful thing. <laughs> you thought last month I was going to, I said something that I should have, that's even worse. They argued that divorce of any kind should be illegal. Let's just forget that that's up there for a second. Divorce of any kind should be illegal. And you should stay married no matter what, for life, every single time until that star goes away and everyone's going to be smiling. But they asked more people, how would you renegotiate? How would you re-term marriage? And a surprising number of people had different perspectives. 21% of people said, Brent, you should have what's in essence presidential terms. That when you get married, that's also wrong. Presidential should be four-year terms. And you have two back-to-back -back four year terms. And after eight years, you have to, by necessity, find a new spouse. There's not any of this re-upping after eight years. You have to find a new spouse. This is not going well for me on the keynote front. 36% said, this is what, this is another one, 36% said what it should be is real estate transactions. You should have a 5, 7, 15, 30 year real estate transaction. And what you can have within the confines of that, you can renegotiate the terms, you can renegotiate the dates all you want, but you kind of have to contract yourselves for a limited period of time within your life that you're going to stay married. And other people said, let's see what this one says, 43% said that we should have test drive unions. What we need to have is a two-year period where nothing's formalized, nothing's legal at this, at this point. And so what you can have within this two-year period is a test drive of the marriage. And if you like the spouse, then you end up, for like a better phrase, buying the marriage. You have a lifetime contract with this, with this spouse. But if you don't like the marriage after two years, you can just kind of back out of it. No harm done, no legality, nothing of that sort. And these are the ways that people have defined marriage. They said, well, instead of this marriage being for a lifetime contract, what we should have is these different things. You can kind of pick and choose whatever you want to. This is, at least in some people's eyes, a much better idea for marriage. Divorce has become so rampant. The idea of leaving marriage in our society has become so rampant that there's even a term for people who leave marriage after a certain number of years, usually in their mid-20s. They call them starter marriages, where you're married for five, six, seven years on average, and you just kind of leave. And then the next marriage you have is a little bit longer than that. The next one's a little bit longer than that. But there's even terms for these kind of short-term unions on a very unofficial scale. And then there's what um, analysts have called intergenerational divorce. That's what these kind of starter marriages create, where you have a person who's been married once, twice, three times, four times, five times plus, 
and their descendants are also prone to divorce. The ratio of divorced marriages after that first, after the parents have been divorced, the ratio of their descendants getting married goes way up. It's just becoming a part of who they are. They feel like since their parents were divorced, their grandparents were divorced, that the idea of being divorced is just something that's very common. It's something that's very natural. And so they view it in this type of way. Regardless of which way you look at it, a lot of people in our world have viewed divorce and viewed marriage as kind of being a temporary thing. That it's not supposed to be for a lifetime. That it's not meant to be intimate. It's not meant to be permanent. It's something that's designed to be whatever you want it to be. As a matter of fact, the idea of cohabitation has skyrocketed recently, most importantly, or most famously at least, with the example of Oprah Winfrey. If you know Oprah Winfrey, she's not nearly, I guess, as popular as the mainstream media she was a decade ago. But if you know anything about Oprah Winfrey, you know that she is famously not married. Now that's not to say that she hasn't had a long relationship with somebody, because she has. For the last, I think, 30 plus years, she has been in a very single type of relationship with one individual. And when she was asked why she's not married, this is what she had to say. She said, we would not have stayed together had we gotten married. Because marriage requires a different way of being in this world. And what I realized is, this is Oprah saying this, what I realized is, I don't want to be married. Because I could not have the life, listen to this, that I created for myself. And that's really where all that comes back to, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? When you talk about divorce, when you talk about these starter marriages and the two-year contracts and the presidential term contracts of marriages, that's where all of these ideas go back to, is the idea that I'm not going to bind myself to anybody because life, after all, is about me. It's not about them. It's not about my spouse. It's not about my children. My life, ladies and gentlemen, is about me. I would argue, too, that to get rid of marriage is to get rid of the fundamental building block of humanity. To get rid of the institution of marriage, and that may sound like a bold claim to some, but to get rid of the foundational block of marriage is to get rid of the building block that all of society is made of. Well, if you think about it, when you look back to Genesis chapter 2, and we don't have to go there right now, but when you look back at Genesis chapter 2, God didn't make babies. He didn't make teenagers. He made adults. And when he made adults, he didn't make families. He made husband and wife. And from this husband and wife, when you go four, fast forward to chapter, Genesis chapter 4, from this husband and wife came families. And families, ladies and gentlemen, are the ones that create communities, which create villages, which create nations. And so a marriage, a happy marriage, is the fundamental building block that all of society, ladies and gentlemen, is built on. That's why Barbara Bush famously said when her husband was president of the United States, she said, your success as a family and our success as a society depends not on what happens in the White House, but what happens inside your house. As the house goes, ladies and gentlemen, so goes the country. That's why we look at marriage as being the fundamental building block. And so when we look at this idea of marriage as a whole, the popular connotation just runs completely contrary to that. Because, ladies and gentlemen, God designed marriage with a very specific end goal in mind, and that's for it to be permanent. Thank goodness that's spelled the right way. It's supposed to be permanent. It's not something that's supposed to be temporary. It's not to be two years. not to be four years. It's not to be eight years. It is designed to be permanent. Now, I understand that there is one monumental exception to marriage, which allows for divorce and subsequent remarriage, which is adultery. That's in Matthew chapter 19. But I want you to look at the way this is phrased in Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 3, Jesus is having this debate and this discussion with the Pharisees who are always trying to catch him in something. Just kind of seem to be their thing. And in Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 3, it says, Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And that any reason is important. Because as they mentioned right after that, or Jesus mentions right after that, in verse 4, he even says to them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Takes it back to creation and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 6, are there no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus takes it back to creation. And he doesn't take it to one Jewish side or the other Jewish side and say, well, I, I agree with well, or I agree with Shemai. He says, I agree with God. But that wasn't good enough for them. Because in Matthew chapter 19, they come back with Moses, their favorite person. And they say in verse 7, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? What they're referencing that passage is Deuteronomy chapter 24, 1 through 4. For Moses commands, or allows rather, for a certificate of divorce for people who find something indecent within their spouse. Specifically, the husband towards the wife. 
And so what Moses says in this passage is, if you as a husband find something indecent within your wife, you are free to divorce her and you are free to remarry. And there's some other stipulations inside of that. But what we do know that he's not talking about Deuteronomy chapter 24 is he's not talking about a lack of virginity and he's not talking about adultery because both of those things described in Deuteronomy are punishable by death. And so the question is, when you look back at Deuteronomy chapter 24, it falls in line with the question here in Matthew chapter 19. Can a person divorce his spouse for just any reason? They burn the toast. They forgot to put gas in my brand new pickup truck, and that really makes me angry, so I'm going to take them down to the courthouse and I'm going to divorce them. So they asked Jesus, can a woman or can a man divorce his spouse for just any reason at all? Jesus takes them to creation, then doubles down on it in verse 8 by talking about their hearts. And he says to them in verse 8, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been that way. In 1955, Marilyn Monroe started a movie called The Seven Year Itch. You may have heard of it, you may have seen it. But what that idea is based on, what that movie is based on, is the psychological principle that after seven years of marriage, that's statistically when people's eyes start to water. After seven years of marriage, that's when you start to look at other people and you start to look at your own situation and you think, well, they have it so much better. Or if I was only with that person, then I would be so much happier. And that's the common rate of divorce. The U.S. Census Bureau describes seven years as the statistical most likely time for people to get divorced. And yet what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 19 is, is from the beginning, that's not been the way it was supposed to be. He allowed it because of the hardest of hearts, but that's not the design. And ladies and gentlemen, what we need to realize about marriage is that's not the design for us either. The design is not an eight-year presidential term or four-year presidential term. The design is not a test drive marriage where we just kind of test it out and move on. The idea is that marriage is to be permanent. And some of that, ladies and gentlemen, goes back to the nature of vows. Look with me, if you would, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, he talks, Solomon does, about the nature of vows. And if, you've, if you're sitting here this morning and you're married, you most likely, I know Colin Courtney did because that marriage was less than a year ago, and I remember it very vividly because it was about a billion degrees outside. <laughs> but if you married this morning, what you remember from your marriage so many is that there were vows involved with that. You had to vow something. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, listen to what Solomon says about vows. He says in verse 4, when you make a vow to God, don't be late in paying, for he has no delight in fool. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the works of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness, rather fear God. The point is not, as some people would argue, the point is not that you should never make vows. And I know there are some people in the world today who will say that you can't take a vow of any kind. You can't take a marriage vow, you can't take a trial vow, or you vow to tell the truth. That's not the point. And Jesus extrapolates this a little bit more when you get to the Sermon on the Mount. The point is in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, do not make empty vows. Because God takes those vows seriously. And if you stand before God and 300 other people on a hot summer day in East Texas, and you vow that you're going to take this person for better or for worse, to life and the death, God takes that seriously. And we need to take it seriously as well. Even in the one exception clause we mentioned earlier from Matthew chapter 19, with the adultery that results in subsequent divorce or remarriage, God's not happy about that. God doesn't rejoice in adultery. He doesn't rejoice in immorality. That's not something that pleases him. He understands that sometimes it happens, and he makes an allowance for that, but that doesn't give God any satisfaction. From the beginning, God has designed marriage to be permanent. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. This is the very first introduction between man and woman, which would be husband and wife. And Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 23. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 23, whenever God brings the woman to the man, listen to what the man says. And that's very important to keep in mind that it's the man speaking here, not God. It's the man speaking here. Verse 23, the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, for she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and there shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife, verse 25, were both naked and were not ashamed. If you read verse 23 through modern-day eyes, it all seems very reliable. Because what in essence 
man is saying here in this passage is, this is now woman. It sounds all very robotic. It sounds all very formulaic. That's not the way the Hebrew translates it. The English translated as, this is now. But the Hebrew has more of the idea of, this now. Or, oh, now. This is, it's an attitude of surprise, of happiness, of joy. And the very first recorded words, if you, if you can imagine this, the very first recorded words in the entire Bible is from a husband that sees his wife for the first time. And the words are joyous. The words are euphoric. The words are happy. Because the man knew just as well as God that in all of creation, everybody had somebody. But he didn't. And so when God brings in the woman, now things are right. Now things are complete. Now he has a help meet. It's a blessing for him from God. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. When he mentions there at the end, we've mentioned this before in a sermon many, many moons ago. But in verse 25, when he says the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed, that has to do, it seems kind of awkward. But at the very core of it, what it means is the fact that there's nothing to hide between these two people. They could be totally vulnerable with each other. They could be totally open. They could talk about their hopes and their dreams, their fears, their insecurities, with 100% confidence that their spouse had their best interests at heart. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what marriage should be. It's not some marriage that's permanent for permanent sake. It's designed for humans, for our benefits. Jordan Peterson, who is a academic based out of Toronto, and I say academic not to delineate him from everybody else, but simply to say that he doesn't have spiritual leanings in this area. But Jordan Peterson is one of the most outspoken advocates for permanence of marriage that I've seen yet. And listen to what he has to say here. He says, what do you do when you get married? I love how honest he is about this. He says, what do you do when you get married? You take someone who's just as useless and horrible as you are, and then you shackle yourself to them. And he says that very tongue-in-cheek. And then you say, we're not running away no matter what happens. Because, listen to this, if you can run away, you can't tell each other the truth. If you don't have someone around that can't, turn or, or that can't run away, then you can't tell them the truth. If you can leave, then you don't have to tell each other the truth. It's as simple as that, because you can just leave. And then you don't have anyone to tell the truth to. The idea of marriage is that two people who are permanently bound together leads into the intimacy that they then enjoy with one another. I should be 100% honest with Melina because I know she's not going anywhere. And that's the way that marriage should be. Hopefully Melina can be honest with me. But if marriage is just a two-year contract, if it's just a four-year, 15-year contract, then there's no incentive for me to be real with her. There's no incentive for me to be honest with her. And so the permanence leads then into the intimacy that we should experience as husband and wife. The fact that they're not going anywhere. The fact that they're staying with us forever. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 gives some of the best marriage advice that in my opinion anybody can receive. It just so happens that it also rhymes. Because in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, what God says is, or what, what Adam says rather, in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. Leave and cleave. You hear that in sermons all over the place. And it is some of the best marriage advice that anyone can ever have. The idea inherent in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 is, I'm now leaving this family unit and I'm putting myself in this family unit willingly. That's the transaction, the personal transaction that's taking place. And yet we all know people, and maybe we're these people ourselves this morning, but we all know people who either haven't left their family, even though they're married to somebody else, or once they're married, they don't cleave to them. They don't hold fast to them. They don't stay true to them because there's something missing. Maybe they don't trust them. Maybe the wife doesn't trust the husband to support her. Maybe the husband doesn't trust the wife that she's going to support him. And what that inevitably creates within a marriage is trust issues. I can't trust my spouse, she can't trust me, because we haven't, once again, left and cleft. I didn't come up with that, that was just something I came up with. But the intimacy of a marriage, ladies and gentlemen, necessitates exclusion. You cannot have intimacy between two people with other people. I can't be intimate with my spouse in any kind of fashion if I'm also intimate with 400 other people. That's not how intimacy works. God designed marriage to be intimate in every aspect of the world. Physical, emotional, mental, all those different things. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to take you there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 15. First Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 15. Of all the things that Paul would grapple with with the church in Corinth, sexual immorality is one of them. 
And he dealt with it in chapter 5 to a certain extent with the man having his father's wife, but he really kind of goes hard on it in chapter 6. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 15, listen to what he says here. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So then take away the members of Christ and make them members of the prostitute? May it never be. He's saying this very literally, by the way. He says in verse 16, Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. It's a call back to Genesis 2. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality, verse 18. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know, verse 19, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. And then the ultimate, the penultimate verse, verse 20, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Paul is speaking very intimately here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 when he talks about the relationship that these two people have, and especially within the realms of the physical relationship. He says you can't take what is special between two people and share it with the world because the intimacy is gone, but yet God has designed you to have that intimacy with each other. But I want you to look specifically at verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 often gets overlooked because it's superfluous, because people don't understand it, we don't understand it. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, he says something as if these people already would have understood it. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? There's a spiritual component, ladies and gentlemen, to marriage. Now, oftentimes, I'm and that's part of what brings us together, that intimacy. The fact that not only is it a physical, that it's emotional, that it's a that it's a possession-wise intimacy, that we don't share everything with the world, but that spiritually, in a sense, we become one flesh. And Paul really extrapolates this when you get to Ephesians chapter 5. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. As he discusses this imagery, he really pulls this imagery out of a man and wife having a spiritual union and being a reflection of God himself. In Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 25, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 25. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present him to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Husbands, then, verse 28, also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, just as Christ also did the church, because, verse 30, we are members of his body. For this reason, verse 31, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Listen to verse 32. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Christ in the church, ladies and gentlemen, is not how Paul began Ephesians 5. When you look at the section of Ephesians chapter 5, it is very obvious, starting a couple of verses before we just read, that he is speaking about marriage. And so when he looks at Ephesians chapter 5, he discusses the marriage covenant, he takes a step back and begins to address a theological and a spiritual theme to marriage. And he says, just as a husband is with his wife, in terms of, or in terms of protection and sacrificing and intimacy and all these different things, so is Christ with the church. And what he doesn't address is in this passage is he's not simply just talking about adultery. He's not saying, don't cheat on your spouse. He's not saying, don't cheat on your husband, don't cheat on your wife. It's more than that. He says there is a spiritual component to marriage where till death do we part means something more than just the physical. It means something more than just emotional. It is a picture of something. And it's a picture of Christ in the church. Christ doesn't leave the church just because he feels like it. Christ doesn't have other brides besides the church. The picture of Christ in the church is what we are supposed to have as well. And that's what makes it not just intimate, ladies and gentlemen, but it makes it holy. We know what that word holy means. We know that holy means set apart, sanctified, something that's separate from the world. And so when we talk about marriage being holy, that's in a sense what we mean. That it's something that's set apart, something that's different, that it's not just every other relationship. That it's not just cohabitation. It's not just dating. It's not just Facebook relationships that are official finally on Facebook. It's more than that. It's something different. And so when we talk about marriage, it's something different. What we feel to realize about marriage sometimes is that marriage is not an end unto itself. 
I think sometimes we go into marriage thinking to ourselves that the sole purpose of marriage is just to gratify ourselves, as just a gift for ourselves, that we have this companionship, and that's that. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of things about marriage that serve those types of things, and marriage is a blessing to us in so many ways that we can't describe. But marriage, ladies and gentlemen, does not serve itself. Marriage is a picture of the relationship that God has with us. And it's a picture, ladies and gentlemen, of God himself. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 1. God does this a lot in Scripture for those of us. Right? If, you, if you spend time reading the Bible back and forth, and you really nail down on some of the things that are said there, what you begin to notice is that God leaves little images of himself around Scripture. He doesn't just say, I am love, and then leaves it and goes on to something else. He, lives in, he leaves images of himself. Ways that we can associate, ways that we can identify with him. And Genesis chapter 1, ladies and gentlemen, is one of those things. Because in Genesis chapter 1, which is the big, <coughs> ultimate creation narrative, and Genesis chapter 2 goes into some more details. But in the big, ultimate creation narrative in Genesis chapter 1, listen to what he says here in verse 26. In verse 26, he says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created them, verse 27, man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. And then verse 27 adds on, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. When he creates man in his image, he creates it, in a sense, to look like himself. And so when you see here in verse 27 where he says, I created man in my own image, speaking as God, I created man in my own image, male and female, I created them. That marriage covenant, ladies and gentlemen, is an image of God. We don't have the time to go into all the different ways that the Trinity can be discussed. And that, to me, is the hardest discussion that anybody can have, theologically speaking. But suffice it to say that the Trinity is three acting as one. Ladies and gentlemen, marriage is two acting as one. And so when we talk about marriage being holy, that's the way that we describe it. You have two separate entities, but they act in, as one. They act in harmony with each other. And so that's why when you look at Ephesians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that's why Paul doesn't hesitate to describe marriage in view of God. Because a happy marriage, ladies and gentlemen, is a picture of God himself. It's a picture of the spiritual union that they have. That's one of the reasons why homosexuality is so oftentimes condemned in Scripture. Not just because it's sinful and it's immoral, but because you have two of the same entities fulfilling one purpose. And that's not the idea. The idea is that you have a male and you have a female, two separate beings, working together. That's what beauty of marriage in a nutshell. The Trinity won't break up in what makes us think that we will be. God can't exist without the Holy Spirit, or He won't exist without the Holy Spirit. Jesus doesn't exist separate from God, the Father, God, the Holy Spirit. They work in tandem with each other. And that's the way, ladies and gentlemen, that marriage should be. Marriage is a testament to God's glory, but a successful marriage is not just two people living together. A successful marriage is two people working in harmony with each other, loving each other, growing together, striving together, trusting each other. That's what makes marriage a gift from God. Should we do away with marriage? I don't think so. I'm a big fan of marriage. I'm a big proponent of marriage. You can see a whole bunch of different things. But the world today looks at marriage and thinks, well, there's nothing holy about it. I would take you one final time to mark the second chapter. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 23. Listen to what Jesus has here. To kind of quote John to put it into context. What's happening here in verse 23, because we'll kind of read through it. What's happening here is the disciples are picking grains of beer on the side. It's a very simple thing that's approved by law. It's nothing that's argumentative to them, or should be argumentative to them. But nevertheless, the Pharisees have an issue with it. Mark chapter 2, starting verse 23. It says, It happened that as he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, his disciples began to make their way along while picking heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, what are they doing is not lawful on the Sabbath. And he said to them, verse 25, Have you never read what David did when he was in need? How he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest? And how he ate the consecrated bread, which isn't lawful for anyone to eat except the priests? And he also gave it to those who were with him. And what Jesus is doing in this instance is saying, You're so quick to condemn the apostles, and yet you would never think about people David. But well, listen to what he says here in verse 27. Jesus says to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the Sabbath under the Old Covenant was to be a time of rest. It was a gift from God to these people. That they, they could take one day off of the week and stop thinking about work and stop thinking about the hustle and bustle of everyday life and just focus on God. It was a blessing for them. Ladies and that's the way that marriage, marriage is supposed to be. Marriage obviously is a lot of work. A lot of us work very hard in that marriage. I'm not trying to diminish any of that. But marriage is designed to be a blessing. To be a gift. That's the way he designed it. And when we start looking at marriage and thinking to ourselves, is it irrelevant? Is it unnecessary? I would argue that it's the most necessary thing. It is the most relevant thing for the well-being of society, the well-being of our souls apart from our relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you haven't started that relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're not married, that's, this lesson may not have resonated much with you, but hopefully it will be in the future. But if you haven't started your walk with Christ, if you haven't placed your trust in Him, and if you haven't washed your sins away by God, and that is the most important relationship that you can have. It's the most important relationship that you'll ever have in your lifetime or in eternity. And I would encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, to start that walk today. Start that journey right now. Do it.